Thank you, Travis. Turn your Bibles, if you would, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. As we continue our study in Colossians, we see God's desire to instill within His children, shall we say, a morality that is based upon His Word. Um, consequently, our morality or our character, our standard of living is based upon the character of God, for His Word reveals who He is. We've already seen in this chapter the quality that God wants to accomplish in us, and all of them reflect the character of God as well. Today, we come to the qualities that God wants to see in the Christian home. If the instructions in these four verses were observed in our homes as He intended them, then believers would enjoy a peace and a happiness in their homes that the world really could not understand how it could even come to be. It's just something so different from what we ordinarily see. Now, uh, beginning in verse 18 of Colossians chapter 3, we read, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Now let's bow together for prayer. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you for your awesome goodness. The the work that you have done to bring us to yourself, to give to us the gift of eternal life, is truly an awesome work, and we're so grateful. I pray that as we look at you and our relationship with you, that you will help us to see how that that relationship with you extends into our relationships with one another, especially in the home. I pray that you would give us wisdom to discern your desire for each of us, and I'm trusting you to use your word in our hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you would, please keep your place here, but let's look to a parallel passage and back in Ephesians chapter 5. The parallels are so striking, I think it is important that we weigh the two passages together. Um, beginning in verses 17 and 18, we see that the subject that the Lord is talking about is the filling of the Spirit. He says in verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, when he's talking here about the will of God, his desire is that we are filled with the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit is not like a glass of water. It's not, the issue is not how much of the Holy Spirit do you have. The word means to be controlled by. And notice it is something that he tells us to do. He says, be filled with the Spirit. So the issue is not how much of the Holy Spirit do we have. The issue is how much of us does the Holy Spirit have control over. And so the issue that he's talking about here is an issue of yielding to his control. So he says, be not drunk with wine, the contrast wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. When we yield to his control, here's what he'll do. He'll give us a new song in our hearts in verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. There will be a new song in our hearts. We will not have no desire for the songs of the world anymore, but there will be a new song in our hearts whenever we are filled with the Spirit. Then in verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at that verse again. <laughs> look at what he says here. Giving thanks always for all things. Now I can't do that. There's a lot of stuff that comes in life that uh, is tough to be thankful for, apart from the filling of the Spirit. When we are yielded to His control, we learn to see all of life from His perspective, that He's going to use the good and the bad and the ugly and everything that we face in life to accomplish good in us and to glory for Himself. So we can, literally, thank the Lord for all things, all the time, and develop an attitude of gratitude, as it were. When we're filled with the Spirit, we'll have a grateful heart. 
And then next he says in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Um, a spirit of submission to others, recognizing that authority figures are there as God's plan in our lives and linking submission to God with submission to others. Now, the word submit means to rank under, to rank one's self under. It's a voluntary thing whereby a person places them under the needs or the authority of another. Notice he says, submitting yourselves one to another. Now, here he's not speaking of authority figures, but he's speaking of our, our relationship with others, particularly to other believers. So in light of that, in the spirit-filled life, he goes on talking about the home here, saying that in verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Her submission is not based on whether or not he deserves it. It's based upon the fact that her God deserves it. And so consequently, it's based upon her walk with God. Um, then in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Here we see the husband's love for his wife is based upon the love of Christ, recognizing that Christ as the bridegroom loves him, and he expects him to emulate that kind of a love. Now, the, the passage goes on to talk about the relationship of Christ in the church, and the church has never been perfect in submission to the Lord, but he has always been perfect in his love for the church. And so that is the um, example that the Lord sets for, for us. Now in chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother. Now, the point is, obedience and honor is the right way to raise children. To teach them to obey and to teach them to honor. That's two different things. Uh, obedience is the actions that, that are required. Honor is the spirit whereby they, they hold the parents with the regard that God wants them to, recognizing that God gave them exactly the parents that he wants them to have. Then it's moved down to verse 4. He says, You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath or exasperation, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord being careful to raise them in the Lord. Don't discourage them uh, into some kind of bitter rejection of authority. The disciplinarian is one extreme on one hand that, that will maintain control in the home, but without affection or instruction. While the permissive parent is, is in many ways far worse in uh, allowing the children to be in control, and thus they would lack stability in their lives. Now, he says to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The nurture is the training and spiritual understanding, teaching them the word of God, speaking of your own love for God and his word, and then admonition is speaking of teaching their, them a sense of duty and responsibility in the various uh, relationships and activities that they have so that they would have a sense of responsibility to the parents, to other siblings, to the elderly, even to property, that they would have a sense of regard for those things. Now, we go back to Colossians 3, or before we consider Colossians 3, I need to mention this as well. Um, in chapter 3 of Colossians, we see in verse 14 where he writes, above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity is that self-sacrificial giving love. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. So we recognize that love and peace are part of the fruit of the Spirit from our study in Galatians. And then in verse 16, we see another parallelism uh, with Ephesians 5, when he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That new song is a part of the Spirit-filled life. So the Lord is here talking about the Spirit-filled life in Colossians as well. Uh, then in verse 15, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him, again, uh, doing all in his name with gratitude in our hearts. Now, these qualities, um, when we are in the Lord, reflects our walk with him. 
The wife's submission is based upon submission to God. The husband's love is based upon the love of Christ and his love for Christ. Children's obedience are based upon pleasing God, and a father's training is a reflection of our heavenly father's work in us. Now let's look at the details here in Colossians 3, beginning in verse 18. First, he addresses the wife, and he says, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord, as it is proper. It's, it's the right thing. It is, a, it is a part of righteous living in our walk with God. Now, again, going back to verses 14 and 15, charity and peace and God's word and gratitude are all in his name. And when we see Christ and his work in salvation, we see his provision, as we talked about earlier, and, and we know that he is working to use your family for his work in you. Now, wives, submit to your own husbands, recognizing, number one, that God is the one who gave you your husband. He gave you the man he has chosen for you. If you're in the Lord, then th this principle of submission is his plan for you, his will. He calls it fit or fitting. That's his order. That's his plan. That is God's plan for the home. God's plan is not something that the husband should demand that she do. But rather, he is speaking to the wife, and he says to her, submit yourselves unto your own husband. In other words, it is generated out of her relationship with Christ and, and the desire to honor him in her relationship with her husband. Trusting Christ to work in her husband, as foolish as he may sometimes be. Um, you know, there has never been a general that has ever won a war without privates. Never happened. Uh, before a battle, the general doesn't stand in front of his troops and teach them the principles of warfare and then grab a rifle and a pistol and goes to fight the enemy by himself. It doesn't happen that way. But rather, he is given a certain responsibility. He has knowledge and a position where he can call for the support that is needed. He has the contacts to make that uh, support happen. While if a private was elevated to his responsibility, he wouldn't have a clue how to get these things done. God did not make wives to be in charge. That is not his plan. Further, we recognize from the whole of Scripture, um, there is, as, again, as we look back in verse 14 and 15 and, and on, there is a greater sense of love peace and gratitude when the wife is in submission. One time a couple went to a, a pastor for counsel, and the wife began to spill all of the burdens that were on her heart, and she was saying she's so worried about their finances, and the pastor said, well, you know, that's your husband's responsibility. You don't need to worry about that. Let him take care of that. I hadn't thought of that before. He said, what, what else is bothering you? And she talked about the children and how they, they weren't exactly what they should be. And again, he says, you know, that's your husband's responsibility. Um, the instructions in the Bible are referencing to the fathers. I hadn't thought of that. And she talked about three or four of the things, and with all of them, he gave the same response. That was her husband's responsibility. And when they were finished, she looked at him and said, well, what am I worried about? You know, I feel so much better. Thank you so much. And the husband looked at him and said, thanks a lot, pal. <laughs> but that's the way it is. That's the way God has made us. The wife's, th there is something about a loving wife submitting to her husband that will serve to strengthen her husband in his job as well as in the home. It is something that builds him up. Her submission, not only that, reveals greater strength in her because it is speaking of a strength of faith in the Lord to work in her husband. You take a, a woman whose personality is very outgoing and, and forceful and the husband may be more easygoing and quieter. For a, a wife in that kind of a setting to submit herself to her husband requires a great deal of spiritual fortitude. Because it doesn't come naturally. But it is something that will bring honor to God and will serve to strengthen the husband so that he will 
take the leadership and the lead more and more. Next, he speaks to the husbands when he says, love your wives and be not bitter against them. The love he's talking about here is the love that Christ has for the church, which is self-sacrificing. It is a giving love. It is based, again, upon the awareness of Christ's love for us. He is the bridegroom and we are the bride, and fully aware of his love compels the husband to love his wife, sees her needs as greater than his own. Now, when the word of Christ dwells in you richly, then his love will dwell in you richly as well, because that's the basis of it. And notice he adds something interesting. He doesn't say in in Ephesians, he says, be not bitter against them. Now, notice he does not say, if she straightens up and flies right, then don't be bitter against her. He said, let that be a character, uh, a, a trait of your character. In other words, that's how Christian husbands are to be. Bitterness is not a part of that relationship. Now, oftentimes what happens when a couple is newly married, the husband doesn't know exactly what to do and how to to make decisions and communicate and so forth, and so the wife kind of takes over. But the husband, it's a natural response that he's going to eventually resent that. And it can foster bitterness. I heard a woman one time say, no man's going to tell me what to do. And so I asked her, but it's okay for you to tell your husband what to do then, huh? Needless to say, she wasn't too happy with me. But the point is um, that this whole mindset of the world where uh, women feel like that this is oppressive to them completely misunderstands what God is saying. It's natural for a man of the world to get bitter if his wife doesn't cooperate with him. He doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't know his word. And and his response to to that conflict is bitterness. And the Lord says, don't let that happen. That's not a part of your relationship. Now, our culture here in America without God is becoming more and more matriarchal. The women are in charge. But it generates bitterness among the men. It does not build up men to be what they need to be. Wives, your husbands need you to help accomplish that in their lives. God says that we're not to reflect the things of the world, but we're to reflect Him, to love as He loves us. Now, how does He love us? He loves us unconditionally because that's who He is, and that's how the husband is to love his wife with no conditions attached. Um, He loves us consistently. He's not up and down. He's not moody. He's not, uh, sometimes he loves us and other times, man, I'm getting kind of tired of this guy. He doesn't know what he's doing. But he loves us consistently. Further, he expresses his love for us continually. Throughout his word, he speaks of his love for us, and throughout his word, he tells us to love as he loves us. In other words, I heard one man say, I told my wife I loved her when we got married. It hadn't changed, so why do I need to say it again? (laughs) He missed it, didn't he? The fact remains, it needs to be expressed repeatedly, daily, several times a day, not only by words, but in deeds. Um... When we understand the magnitude of his love for us, then then the husband will incorporate into his character this kind of love, and it will be consistently applied to his wife. Now, you know, it's a lot easier for the wife to submit to a husband who loves like that. It is a lot easier for the the wife uh, to submit and also for the husband to love her when she does submit. Isn't it interesting that God knew what he was talking about? (laughs) It works every time it's tried. Now, again, a grateful heart filled with the Word of God is what will enable husbands to love their wives like this. Then in verse 20, he, he addresses the children. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to God. 
Now, children have to be taught this, and this really is a verse that, that is instructing parents how to raise their children. They must be taught to obey their parents in all things. Whether they agree or not, they're still expected to obey. Now, children have to see the desire of their parents to please God before they are going to have a desire to please God. The greatest lesson that children can learn is from a parent's example. More is caught than is taught in dealing or teaching children. You are the only example they have. When they grow up and they get married, they will apply their, their, their life, their relationship with their mate is going to be directly related to how your relationship with your mate is. That's why it is so important that you demonstrate to your children outward expressions of love and affection that serves to build them up continually. Uh, teaching them, teaching your children to love your parents, to love God, to love your siblings, to love others. There is something about the statement that was made, the greatest thing a man can do for his children is to love his wife. In other words, openly expressing love and affection. That will give them a sense of stability. When the children know that mommy and daddy love each other, that is something that will help to, to strengthen them. Further, when they hear of your efforts to live according to God's word, that will carry a huge impact up, upon them. Now talk about good dinner talk, the word of God and your desire to do what he says. If, you, if the children hear dad talk about, you know, I lost my temper today, and, and I know God has told me not to do that, I, I, I want you to pray for me that, that I can get a handle on that. Um, that's the kind of thing that will teach them by example. Children know that parents cannot be perfect, but they, they learn not only from your obedience and the teaching that you have, but even when you confess your sins before them, when they hear you acknowledge those areas where you've blown it, where you have disobeyed the Lord. Your freedom to ask their forgiveness when you blow it with them, if you lose your temper with your children and you go back to them and ask them for forgiveness is going to be a huge lesson to them. They will see you living differently from worldly parents, and they'll hear you tell of your love for Jesus. Now, brethren, listen, this is something we need to talk about and sing about all the time with our kids, our love for Jesus, our love for the Lord. It needs to be so evident that they hear it all the time. And when they hear you teaching them from his word as being the authority, the basis of living, that is the kind of lesson that will help mold their character to one of submission to God. Now, obedience, notice he says, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. In other words, teach them not just to obey because you say so, but the principle whereby they are demonstrating their love for God. Learning to, to please God, wanting to please God, and a way to please God is in obedience to the parents. Disobedience to parents is displeasing to God, as well as to the parent. But whenever they do, God will freely forgive if they will genuinely confess it, and the parent will forgive as well. Now, brethren, it's vitally important that we teach our children the three parts of obedience. It is not obedience unless all three parts are there. Number one, doing exactly what they're told not in their own way. Number two, doing it right away, not in their own good time. And then number three, doing it with a happy on their face, not griping or whining while they do it. All three must be there. They can do exactly what they told and they can do it right away, but because they're upset, they're slamming things around. That's not obedience. Um, they can do it right away and they can do it with a happy on their face, but they do it the way they want to do it instead of how you tell them to do it. Or that's not obedience either. Or they can have a happy on their face, do exactly what they're told, but when they get good and ready. That's not obedience. All three parts need to be there. Now, we need to teach those three 
elements of obedience and let them know we're expecting that rather than them teaching us three levels of volume and repeating what we want them to do. Um, learning to speak one time and actually expect obedience is something that very few parents, even believing parents, really seem to, to understand. This is the kind of obedience that will honor the Lord and that will please the Lord. And when they can learn that, that will carry over to their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing is teaching them to love the Lord. Many children raised in Christian homes learn to love the Lord before they're ever saved. In fact, they, they learn to trust the Lord after they've already learned to love the Lord. Uh, but teach them to love the Lord and how much the Lord loves them. And the way to please Him is an obedience to what He says. The fact remains, our disobedience to God is a reflection on Him to the world. Just as their disobedience to us is a reflection on us and on our God. Now, the primary time of teaching these things is when they're from the years of one to six. After that, it really gets tougher to be able to incorporate it, but it's still necessary. If you're consistent in this time frame, they will learn. And it does, it's not to say that there may not be episodes of, of discipline needed afterwards, but those first six years are critical in teaching principles of obedience. Further, in verse 21, he says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Do not provoke your children, is speaking of exasperating the children, to place them in a situation that they don't see any way out. They can be discouraged by inconsistency of the parent's life. Our discipline that, that uh, is with a heavy hand without affection. Now, it's never right to say to your children, do as I say, not as I do. It's vitally important that we are, are teaching them principles to live by so that we are teaching them along the way, do as I say, because of the principle that's involved. A disciplinarian may keep order in the home, but if they're, if they're not teaching by principle and affection, it can discourage them. Times of discipline, in reality, should also be times of great affection. Sometimes with the discipline, sometimes right after the discipline, uh, but it, it's extremely important to be a part of the discipline. The permissive parent allows the children to decide the order of the home. And the parent is really being self-focused because they're more concerned with being liked and having the approval of the child than having the child's obedience. It is not the most a loving uh, approach, it is the most damaging approach. When the child is in control in the home, that child is not happy. I've never seen one that's really happy when they're in control at the home. But when the parents are, are, are in charge and they know that and it's clearly understood, then the child has a stable environment. They know what their life is. That's why it's so important, especially for the fathers, to take charge in the home. Further, a permissive parent will only serve to generate greater anger. When they grow older and their frustrations that things aren't going the way that they did with mommy and daddy, that, and, that, and the teachers don't cooperate, and then the law officials don't cooperate, it only serves to generate more anger. There needs to be in our training of our children, a proper balance of love and affection with righteousness. When we think about love and affection, perhaps it can be described as five touch points of love. Number one, encouraging words, building up your child's spirit, strengthening them, positive encouragement. Number two, acts of service where you as a parent do more than is expected in serving them in some way. You have them to, to do a chore uh, to, without saying anything. Just help them to get the chore done. Uh, acts of service is an expression of love. Quality time, a time of listening and communicating. It's not so much a time of watching television, you're not communicating. 
uh, it's not a time in which you're just playing a game, but there is a t that's a part of it, but it's a time of interacting and communicating with a child. Quality time. Physical touch and closeness cannot be um, overemphasized. There should be lots of hugs in the child's home. Fathers especially, it's so critical that, that you as the, the head of the home, that you are careful to express affection for your daughters as well as for your sons. Um, you, the idea of just being close, letting them know that you're, you're so grateful they are your child, letting them know that you're glad that God has brought them into your, into your life. And then number five, um, well, I guess that was the fifth one. But the, uh, the fact is different children respond to different touch points of love. And it's important to learn which one seems to push their button a little more. They seem to express more gratitude and, and uh, return the love more with the different act. Again, encouraging words, acts of service, gifts. Oh, that's the other one. Uh, giving gifts, showing that you're thinking of them when you're away. The quality time, the physical touch and closeness. Each of these serve a purpose in ministering to your children. But then there are principles of discipline and righteousness as well. It's so important in the issue of discipline to discern between childishness and foolishness. Um, childishness is just where in their immaturity, they're, they're, just, uh, they're just doing what kids do, but foolishness has an element of rebellion in it, an element of defiance. <clears throat> the purpose of discipline is to instill character. Discipline will exchange wisdom for their foolishness. They will learn to be wise instead of foolish. Discipline ranges for anywhere from corrective words to consequences that are more severe. The discipline should, of course, reflect their age. They're not, it's not the same discipline for a toddler that it would be for a 10-year-old. Uh, they should also reflect the intensity of their rebellion. Sometimes you can correct with a verbal warning. Other times with words and actions. But then sometimes there are consequences, and the purpose of those consequences is to bend their will to yours. When consequences are, are necessary, it's important that there is enough of those consequences to bend the will. It's important whenever there is a disobedience with rebellion that you express grief at the, their rebellion. <clears throat> that they understand they've crossed the line. And then some suggestions would be to send them to their room to think about it. And then when you go in, you talk to them and explain clearly what their disobedience was, how they had defined you as their authority, and then administer the discipline that is required. Now, Scripture speaks very clearly about using a rod of correction. Um, uh, spanking. That is not child abuse. God has provided padding so that that's not the case. But it is something that is absolutely essential uh, for every child to learn. Now, <clears throat> spanking is not something you do to the child, but it's something you do for the child. It's not given out of your frustration, but out of their rebellion. And it's critically important they understand that. Their actions, their rebellion is what has led to this. It's not a punishment of last resort. It is an exercise of love. It's not just to change behavior, but the attitude of their heart. It, instead of causing frustration in the child, it is something that will serve when ministered properly to clear their guilty conscience. Brethren, a spanking is something that serves to mold a lifelong character. And it is something that, again, another suggestion in the administering of a spanking that they learn to cry softly. That will show that their heart has, uh, has been bent to your will. That will show submission when they learn to cry softly. After the spanking, you want to hold them in your lap re-explain the, the offense and the consequences that were there, and teach them to ask forgiveness from the Lord. Some of the sweetest times with my children were times when they were getting control of themselves and their 
tears were beginning to dry up, and then they prayed so sweetly, asking the Lord to forgive them. And then teach them to ask you to forgive them and be quick to grant it. Uh, affirm your forgiveness. Affirm to them God's forgiveness as well. And then close the episode with prayer. And sometime in the next few moments, be sure you express affection for them so they know you're not rejecting them, you're rejecting the action. Again, discipline of any kind should never be in public. It's between you and your child. It's personal. It's never to humiliate or shame or intimidate. Rebellion is about broken relationships more than the effect of the sin itself. And so what you're out to accomplish is a relationship a re rebuilding, shall we say. Attitude adjustment, I guess you could call it. But the point is that you are seeking to help them to uh, yield themselves to your authority. Now, brethren, this is something that it's not easy. It takes time. It's not something that can be done quickly. But it is something that is well worth the investment, especially for fathers, but also for the mothers. Because the mothers, of course, are equal partners in the uh, teaching of love and affection as well as the discipline that is required. Now, as we look at these verses, let's look at them again in verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. In a, here, in a nutshell, is what God wants us to have in our homes. And I trust that all of us can see areas where we can strengthen our homes, I know every time I go through this, this passage and others like it, I see places that I need to ask my wife for forgiveness and purpose to be more consistent. These are principles that each of us need to learn to evaluate, and as we come to our conclusions as to what they mean in our, in our lives and what we need to change, what we need to strengthen. Uh, every aspect of the Christian home, is a reflection of our relationship with Christ, whether as the husband, the wife, the child, or the parent. The home is the basic unit of ministry. For, a listen, a genuine Christian home, as he defines it here, is so different from the world. It serves to bring attention to the power of Christ working in us. It is in the home that he demonstrates his power to work, charity, peace, the new song, and the gratitude attitude. Dearly beloved, I trust that, that these suggestions and these ideas will, will serve to be a, of help to you as we think about what God wants to accomplish in our homes, in our individual lives, as well as in the lives of our children. Let us bow together for prayer. With every head bowed and every eye closed, Perhaps the Spirit of God highlighted something that He wants you to change in your home. I'm going to ask our pianist to play through a stanza of a hymn. As the Spirit of God speaks to your heart, would you yield to His control? Would you purpose to live accordingly that you could bring honor and glory to Him in your home? Fathers, we are reminded of your expectation of us in the home. I'm trusting you to work in each of us, that you would use your word in our hearts to change us, to enable us to bring honor and glory to you in our homes. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you've already done. We're trusting you to use your word to accomplish your purpose in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn to hymnals for our closing hymn, number 369. Let's stand together and sing the first stanza. 